it's asking for our consent again. Got it. Got That's it. It's probably going to be on Facebook Live now. I'm pretty sure we're already live. It says live Perfect. in the corner. Perfect. Cool. Welcome to Facebook Live, Tom. You've never done any media anything before. No. So. It's my first time. <laughs> yeah. first, I haven't first been on a live in forever, camera. actually. My last live, I have a good story about my last live. You know Matt Busby from NCM, right? Oh, yeah. So he asked, it was like a month into quarantine last year, and they were like, we're so bored. We don't know what we're doing with our time. So we're doing these uh, Instagram lives. Would you like to come on? And I was like, sure, I'll come on. But I had just bleached my hair, and I had just dyed it purple because I didn't know what I was doing with my life at the time either. And they asked if I wanted to be a part of their all mustache staff part. Like they were doing a mustache march or something. <laughs> so I had purple hair and a mustache on a live stream. And I took a picture of it to say like, hey, come join us on this Facebook live. And then GRM used it and put it in a print ad or something. No way. So I'm with purple hair and a mustache in a freaking magazine <laughs> all because of Matt Busby at NCM. Oh, man. That's funny. That's actually that's actually pretty relevant because Matt was our uh, our most popular guest so far in 2021 on Apex Pro Facebook Live. Um, we did like a pre-NCM track walk tutorial, kind of Matt's keys to the track. Um, and then I think before that, Johnny Chachowski has been one of our one of our most popular guests so far. So I bet we can I bet we can beat that. But you should be able to share the stream now. So folks, if you're if you're joining in, I see we've got some live viewers already. Um, we've got Mr. Tom O'Gorman in the house. And we'll uh, we'll get into it shortly, but we're going to take a minute here to to share this to all the relevant Facebook groups and pages and that sort of thing to make sure that people are following along. But if you're watching the stream, hit the like button. Even better, hit the wow face or the love button or the care icon, because those things really drive those Facebook algorithms and engagement and whatnot. Um, and that helps a lot because you all know that you want to hear what what Tom has to say. I'm sure. Ryan, are we looking good from your end? You are looking good. Yeah, we've also got Ryan Finch here. And we've got some guest appearances behind Tom as well in the shop. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> you didn't know you were getting awesome. looped, looped into this, huh? <laughs> like, I'm Ryan, to work on my car. <laughs> Ryan, can you share this to the Apex users group and uh, Laptimer Plus group? Cool. Well, I'll, I'll do a quick intro spiel, Tom, while you're working on sharing stuff and whatnot. Um, but for those of you that I think a lot of folks join us regularly for these. So thanks again, if you're watching again, uh, I'm seeing lots of familiar names already. Uh, but we uh, are here on Facebook Live to talk about some cool driving related content, kind of anything that's related to the to the motorsports world. We use these uh, Facebook Live sessions to highlight friends of ours in the industry and people that are doing cool stuff um, in motorsports and, and then talk about some things that we can learn from. So we've got um, Tom O'Gorman here tonight, who's a former professional, well, still able to probably beat pretty much anyone in professional motorsports, but a former professional racer and, and factory um, affiliated uh, driver with Honda and Honda Performance Development and various series. And Tom and I first met probably on track in a World Challenge event um, at some point in like 2015 or 2016, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. I remember passing the basement cars at road America and it was like, you know, a 25 mile an hour speed difference. Um, crazy those, times. Those were wild days, the all three classes together. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Continue. Yeah, no, that was totally crazy. Um, so when, when I had a touring car, uh, an Accord Honda Accord touring car, Tom was running in B spec and then ended up winning TCA championship. Right. And then you went into the, and ran the civic type R, um, and some TCR cars and IMSA and, um, did a lot of really cool stuff there. So Tom is here to talk a little bit about data, a little bit about um, how other forms of motorsports can help our driving. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming, Tom. Thanks for having me. I've been super jealous of all those other cool people you just talked about getting to come on here. So I'm flattered to get to come on myself. <laughs> That's right. Finally get to uh, get to jump on. I know it's been, it's like, we've had a lot of conversations kind of offline talking about coaching and data and whatnot. And um, it just, I've been meaning to ask you for a long time. So it's, it's good to, uh, good to finally get you on the show. Yeah. So cool. Before we, before we go into the conversation, um, and talk more about driving stuff, just wanted to mention a couple of apex pro related things. We'll kind of get it out of the way at the front end of the show. But for those of you that are using apex pro check for an app update, the next time you open the app, it'll be new. We just launched a couple of different things. 
Um, the, uh, for those of you using our video feature, it's a lot smoother now. So the video rendering and video stabilization is vastly improved, especially for people with new iPhones like iPhone 12s. Um, and then also the Apex Pro OBD2 uh, device that connects to your Apex app with Bluetooth. We improve the connection reliability for most vehicles. So if any, I know several people have had connection issues with their car in our OBD2 products. So we actually reverse engineered how another app connected with our white label at OBD2 device. So should have a lot more success there. So update that app. And uh, I think that's all from the Apex Pro side, but um, awesome. So Tom's here tonight to talk a little bit about how we use data. Tom's also um, a highly rated professional coach and an incredibly quick driver and has some awesome speed tips and, and secrets for everybody. But we're here to talk a little bit about how we use data versus how maybe we coach with data. And then also want to talk about autocross and drifting and other forms of motorsports. But um, Tom, you want to do a little like, uh, who is Tom? You know, um, what do people that don't know you need to know about you? Definitely. Um, so I've been a participant in motorsports for about 15 years, but I grew up as a, a fan of racing. I lived about two and a half hours from mid-Ohio. So I uh, started going there with my dad when I was in diapers still. And we were always, every spectator event you could buy a ticket for, we were there on the fence in the S's watching um, everything from at the time the runoffs were there for a, like a 10 or plus year run uh, through to, you know, IndyCar and anytime you know, Trans Am came, uh, all of that stuff. I just fell in love with motorsports at Mid Ohio watching, but we were never participants other than my dad was a car guy. Am I still here? Yeah, you're good. Um, and uh, got the chance to start autocrossing when I was 15, around the same time that my dad had bought a Miata. And it was the first time both of us became participants. Um, I fell in love with autocross and my cousin, Sean, introduced me to the national level of autocrossing. So I went down the slippery slope, huge into that. My dad never loved <laughs> autocrossing, but he started doing track day stuff. So our, our motorsports kind of separated and um, I autocrossed nationally for seven years, um, got as deep into it as anybody does or anybody can. And um, after I won my first national championship in 2013, I kind of realized that's where the road stops with autocross as far as doing anything bigger and better, um, which is all great and fine. And I, I still autocross to this day, but I wanted to try a little bit more. So I bought a road race car with some money I'd saved up, got my feet wet with road racing and a crowdfund campaign allowed me to start to race in World Challenge where we met. Um, so I got to do two races in 2015. And then um, that introduced me to uh, the people at Honda Racing, and through meeting them and a little proposal I made for them to loan me a car in 2016, I won the, the B-Spec Championship and World Challenge in 2016, and they helped me get in cars ever since. So that was when I was racing the Civic Si and then the TCR Civic. I also got to race an Audi TCR and IMSA a little bit, but 2016 to 2019 is kind of where my pro racing window happened, uh, at least the, the one that I've done already anyway. <laughs> Hopefully there's more of that, but um, after last year, all this stuff, everybody's life changed, obviously, last year. But I had to regroup a little bit, and I made a terrible life choice one July afternoon, and I ended up <laughs> with this thing behind me. Now I race full-time with Grid Life and GLTC, and uh, rather than making my living as a pro driver, I make my living as a pro coach um, and still like to drive whatever I can. And I've gotten to also adventure into some different types of motorsports this year, so I think we're going to talk about that later. But that's me in a nutshell. And that's so cool. The uh, I, so the first time I remember seeing you at the track, I wasn't racing this weekend, but I was um, in 2015. I had a couple. I had a couple of. Um, sorry, that was me from clicking on the stream. I'm trying to get to where I can see comments. So um, Ryan, you might have to serve up questions because I can't. I can't see them. Hold on one second. How do I turn off the audio in here? Man, there's a lot of people commenting on here, guys. I apologize for my. Hectic audio. Yeah, one second. Hi, Tom, you can. That, I'm proud of you. Take it away. My audio is messed up. I'm gonna work on this. Real there we go. Okay, I got it. I'm good. Sorry about that. So when I try to click on the stream to see everybody that's commenting and interacting, the stream audio starts playing through my computer and then it starts getting regurgitated. So sorry about that. Um, but I was at mid Ohio, I think it was your first world challenge race. And I was working on, I was in under Shay's tent, uh, Shay racing, working on the, um, the Honda of Alabama Accord. 
because I was kind of talking to them about building a car because they had already, you know, built the car and homologated it with World Challenge. And they had offered to support me and provide a bunch of parts and all their sponsors were willing to contribute. And so I was like, oh, wow, this could make a lot of financial sense. So I was there like working on the crew for them that weekend. And I remember you, I think you won one of the races that weekend. You didn't? My first pro weekend was a disaster. It was me and my dad and a couple of friends scrambling in a place we didn't belong <laughs> but uh, uh i did i podiumed one race but it was kind of messy <laughs> gotcha yeah i think um i think nick luger was running out of shay's tent and i think you guys got into each other at some point <laughs> yeah that's funny yeah. and that's that's so cool though because then we we kind of so i kind of like flirted in that area until 2017 and it was really cool to see you just like you know, getting a deserving opportunity and setting the world on fire with your pace and, um, and winning championships and kind of going from there. So it's cool to kind of reconvene and, and both be back kind of in the grid life community and the grassroots motorsports community and doing a lot of coaching. Um, but tell, tell me about your coaching experience. Like, is it, do you enjoy it? Is it rewarding? Cause I think that's kind of what we're, we're going to get into. Um, yeah, anyway. no, it, it certainly is. It's, it's been really interesting because I actually started, if you call it coaching, I started instructing autocross schools when I was 17. Um, there's a, a school called the Evolution Performance Driving School and the owner Mike called me when I was still, in my opinion, super, super green. Like I, I was, I was always quick in autocross, but I used to be a throw everything at the wall and see what sticks kind of driver. And I had these ridiculous theories, like the first element of every course should be flat out and all this stuff. So I wasn't necessarily technically the best driver, even though I was a good driver, I think. Um, and Mike called me to teach a school. So I show up as a 17 year old with basically my gut instincts to teach somebody and through a lot of other people kind of helping me learn how to verbalize what I knew because I knew it here and I didn't know how to verbalize it to others. Um, that was really a, the first journey that I had with coaching, I think was, was teaching those autocross schools. But then um, the second stage of that, after kind of putting that on hold for a little while, I've done a lot of working in, you know, little instructing more than coaching. Um, but when I was pro racing in 2017, 18, 19, I would go to grid life events and I would be bored out of my mind when everyone else was playing with their race cars and mm -hmm. I didn't have anything to do. Um, so I kind of had this idea, like I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have been able to drive at a lot of these tracks and a lot of these cars. And I, uh, I had the idea to just offer to drive people's cars, let them ride with me and let them feel what I do. And then basically informally coach them um, and try to help them be a better driver through like a hands-on experience inside the car. And um, it was a little bit of a roundabout way to just, you know, get some seat time too and have some fun. But it kind of turned into a regular thing where if I was at a grid life event, people would start to ask me to drive cars and it grew into other track days as well. And I, I never charged for it. I was always just, you know, I was having a good time and it was a learning experience for me too. But through doing that, I learned how to start coaching people and we started to incorporate some data and some videos sometimes. But because I was racing full time, like I, I never really was that, you know, particular about it wasn't a business for me. It was just for fun. Um, so last year when my, um, when my work situation with pro racing changed, I realized that I was basically perfectly set up to turn that into professional coaching as a business rather than as a, you know, coaching for fun. Um, so a lot of what I've done is actually a very different model of professional coaching than what most people are used to hearing about. So rather than going and doing a whole day or a whole weekend with somebody at a, at a race weekend or something, I tend to be working with a larger quantity of people in a one-on-one -on -one environment that's basically one data lap, um, a little bit of video, a little bit of data, and one large download, and then sync ups throughout the weekend. And I've worked with anywhere between you know, two or three and up to at NCM for TT Nationals, I worked with 17 people. And you get the still really good one-on-one -on -one experience with people, but you can also, I think, capture the audience that doesn't necessarily get the ability to work with somebody in coaching that way because they're not spending a thousand dollars for a day or more they're spending you know a hundred bucks and they get their value out of that but because i'm doing it in a smaller quantity and they're doing it on a weekend that they're already there it's affordable for them but i can do it with with more people if that makes sense so yeah that's sort of what's taken off in the last two years and um in addition to occasionally doing the the standard you know go to a weekend and, and work with people yeah, um, but it's been really fun kind of, 
I don't know if it's blazing my own path or whatever, but figuring out my own business model and my own market within that, that world has been pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I do really like that. Um, uh, yeah. Ryan's putting some questions in front of me, so we'll, we'll get to get to some questions here soon. Um, there's all sorts of good ones in the comments already, but it, it's good to see everybody. But I, I, I really like that. Um, the element of that model that's really cool is that you can plant seeds with a lot of different people that, that understand. Because a lot of times the reason people don't hire a coach is not because they don't want to get better, but it's because they just don't understand how somebody even coaches racing or, or how you can coach motorsports or like, why would you pay a lot of money for someone to help you with that? And whether you can afford it or not, sometimes that's a hard jump to make. Uh, and, and so it's really cool that you kind of plant these seeds with a lot of people and now they can share that experience with their friends and talk about it. And then they can justify it to themselves. Like, should I invest more time and money and effort in a coach? Um, I, th I think that's really cool, but it's uh, it's good to see folks on here. Jeff Harding, Jim Smithaline, Christian, uh, DJ Alessandrini, Ron Mullet. Got a lot of people jumping in here. Chris Finnegan, if you guys are watching, jump in the chat and say, Hey, uh, and ask Tomo questions in the chat. We will go down through the chat and, serve up some questions for, uh, for Tom as we go. So jump in there. Marlon, someone says Tomalicious in all caps. Good to see you this past weekend, Marlon. Hey, Marlon. Um, got a, got a lot of, got a lot of good people jumping on here. Um, Ryan also just dropped a link to what Tom was just talking about. Um, ASM, uh, website has professional coaching services. So the events that you guys attend, you can actually schedule ahead of time to do one of those, uh, coaching sessions or like a, a four session, um, coaching uh, event as well that's what it looks like yeah it's been it, it's been cool though to work with i mean this is jumping around but i'm at asm right now we're prepping for a race weekend in kansas this weekend um and basically kind of taking that model that i started doing under this tent because uh it's also something that that andy smedegard works on with people as well and i think the the other part of it is i mean you you mentioned it a little bit but the other part of it is truly just the affordability of getting coaching is sometimes not feasible if you don't know the right way to kind of pursue it so i think we're you know our goal is to also hopefully bring that to a larger group of people and some of my favorite moments from this year have been we're i mean we're doing it out of his trailer so we have the big trailer set up and people will bring me the data or the video and we've got a laptop up and and then somebody else who we're working with comes in and they get to listen to the little bits that we're talking yeah. about with one driver. And then we turn the other driver's video on and it turns in, it's not a collaborative coaching necessarily, but everybody gets the little bits and pieces of, uh, of what somebody else might be doing too. So yeah. uh, that's, it's, it truly really came out of, okay, I, I don't know a lot of people in um, the high end track day market. I don't know a lot of people in Porsche club or BMW club, but I know a lot of people in these grassroots world where, they're not going to have an extra grand to spend at the track, but they might have a hundred bucks. And how do yeah. I, how do I offer what I know I can bring to somebody like that who either really, really wants the coaching, but can't afford it or has no idea how to get better. But then their buddy hears them talking about it and they go, oh, okay, maybe this is my opportunity yeah. to go, you know, a little quicker. Yeah. I've, I've had the opportunity to do a lot of those sessions as well, particularly like at NCM at time trial nationals and some other events that apex pro has done where you have, one driver's data that you're going over and you're pointing out some stuff. And then all of a sudden you end up with five, six or seven people that are all watching and, and they start asking the question, could I be doing the same thing? You know, and you can tell that it kind of sparks that interest because a lot of times we like drivers very commonly, and, and you can probably speak to this too, struggle with some of the same things, you know, like it, we all struggle with getting better coming off the brake pedal, you know, getting a quicker transition from wide open throttle to braking, rolling speed through the middle of the corner, you know, all those things, we all struggle with those, but how everybody understands them might be a little different or how each driver, the, the thing that, that clicks to help them understand something might have to be conveyed differently. But how do you, how do you use data? Because this was kind of our original talking point. And we talked about last night, how if we have too much to talk about, we won't talk to it all. We're, we're already like 20 minutes in and we haven't even hit the first one, but how do you use data for, you know, finding time for yourself? You know, you're going out for GLTC qualifying and, and you want to qualify on pole versus when you're looking at data for, for someone else, What's your approach. My, my first exposure to data was um, not even the first years of pro racing. It took a couple of, of seasons of that to really kind of start to dig in when we had, um, I think it was a MoTeC in the first car and then we had AIM systems and things like that. So that was the first time that we, because we had to pull the data and submit it to the series, it was like in my hand already. And like, oh, I can actually look at this. Um, 
but I think it's a really interesting concept that you know, like, how does, how does the driver use the data for themselves versus how do you use it for coaching? And I honestly find that I, I think I use them fairly differently. Um, but I think there's a lot more going on in the car as well. So the first thing I do is, um, I mean, I simply am trying different things almost every lap if I'm in a learning mode, um, whether I'm learning the setup of the car or the new track, whatever it might be, I'm trying not to be, um, redundant with what I'm trying. You know, if I, if I didn't try three different breaking points or if I didn't try two different lines or two different turning points, then I'm not being productive with the session. So the first thing that I'm doing is starting in the car to make sure that I'm kind of collecting that data because the computer is smart, but it can only really read what the driver has given it. Um, so I'm trying to consistently challenge what might or might not work. Um, and the first bit of it, which this is a little bit taboo, especially in driving schools and stuff, is I'm using my predictive timer um, if I have one available. I want to make sure that, you know, if I'm trying something in the moment, I should be able to tell whether or not off the seat of my pants, but sometimes you can't. So if, if it's confirmed on, you know, that predictive timer that the change that I just made made me faster, then I know that that's what I should be doing unless I'm trying something new that made me faster yet still. So... Um, I don't coach people to use their predictive timers, but I, I absolutely am using that as a tool in the car. Then when I have more time to think about it, I go off track and I pull up the laptop and I look at the squiggly lines and I figure out, okay, these different things that I'm trying, first of all, the best lap is, is you know, the baseline typically. And you pick your next best lap and your, your other best lap and you kind of start to look at that. But I find looking at sectors also to be very helpful. Um, I want to know what I left on the table. So if I'm looking at the big table um, of, of different sectors for the entire session, then I can start to figure out, okay, if I'm consistently faster toward the end of the session, what was I doing differently? Or what was I doing differently on this one lap where I have this standout? Or even better, oh, that one lap, even though it looks like it was really good in this sector, is because I blew the braking zone at the end of that straightaway. Or, you know, you, you, you figure out the little nuances of why you got to go quicker or why you didn't go quicker. Um, and I basically fine tune off of the, the trial and error in the, in the car and data confirmation after to make sure that I'm not leading myself down the wrong path. But I find that process now to be very quick for myself. Yeah. And it's really hard to do that much. You know, the, the bandwidth is one thing I find with yeah. working with people is, you know, I'm not chasing low hanging fruit so much as I'm doing all this trial and erroring and I'm picking up these different things every lap where in a coaching situation, I'm tending to, here's your low hanging fruit, here's your challenge. This is the thing your bandwidth should be spent on and do everything else the same. Even if there's little nickels and dimes here, you wanna go after the dollars, you know? Right. Yeah, that, that's a really good way to put it. Um, man, that's so, I, like we talked last night and I was like, I need to think more about that topic. And so I wrote like a whole page of notes on how I think I, I do it differently, but something that I noticed that was kind of funny, just like, logistically, not even like philosophically, but just like what I actually use, like when I'm looking at the data, I use sector times more for myself than I do for coaching. I don't know why, but, but I do. And it, and it tends to, I think it's kind of that same thing that you mentioned is like the, the, um, being the one that generated the data, meaning like you're the driver, you created the data, you know, what you did in the car, you kind of do that like subjective debrief afterwards, like what I do well, what did I not do well? Did I try a bunch of stuff? Did I get stuck in a rhythm? Did I get stuck behind another car? Was there all this, you know, you kind of can digest all that. And when you've used data a lot and you can kind of um, process stuff a lot more quickly, you kind of jump to the, the finer nuances a little faster. And I think that's the primary difference is that I'm looking for something that's more subtle. Sometimes it's it's still not super subtle, but I'm able to jump directly to what I, I want. And I expect like when I was at NOLA for GLTC, I knew turn six and seven on the back of the track were my weakest spots. And I, I knew so strongly from the predictive in the car, from the Apex Pro, because it was freaking red as anything all the way through seven, a couple of laps. I knew that that's where I needed to look. Whereas with a customer I'm, I'm, or a coaching client or looking at someone else's data, I can't make any of those assumptions safely because I, I don't, I didn't input the data. So it's like fundamentally different, but it sounds kind of, kind of similar to how you're approaching it though. Like, like, I think it's the same thing. It's, it's the difference between knowing, having the fundamental knowledge of knowing what you did as a driver. Like you're saying, I tried a bunch of different stuff. And you kind of have an idea of what that is. Whereas when you're looking at someone else, you're seeing some trends in the speed trace and you might see that they're 
one lap, they have a curve on the top of the speed trace and they're not going straight to the gas. And now you have to look straight to the brake. You have to look into that a little bit more and see if it's consistent. And, and if it is consistent, then that's what you want to talk about, you know, whereas yeah, I think some of, yeah. some of what I've uh, grown to understand is what I would starting with autocross, which I know we're going to talk about autocross later, but um, there wasn't really data systems when I started at least that I was aware of much. I mean, there might've been, you know, these high-end systems, but none of the cars I was driving, I never had my own car. I was always co-driving. So I was never really able to look consistently at even the same car's data, let alone had data at all. Um, so a lot of what I was learning was trial and error within the context of autocross. Um, so when I came over to road courses, I feel like I already had flexed the muscle of feeling what works, um, even with the butt dyno kind of thing, rather than using the data. And then you use the data as the confirmation for making sure that your butt dyno is calibrated properly. But yeah. um, it That's definitely powerful. took a long time to, as much as I, I mentioned, like I had to learn to how to verbalize what I know here into coaching other people. It took a long time to figure out how to reflect for myself as well. And that's when I went from that, throw everything at the wall and see what sticks driver to a very calculated I'm going to go into every event with a plan. And that was just with autocross. So the, that coming, you know, having that exposure into road racing and any sort of track driving, I'm very grateful that I did that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. I think you, you had a huge advantage over me from the, probably when you came to world challenge versus when I came to world challenge, I was not a serious autocrosser before. And autocross is such a good, like microcosm of competition that it's so intense and it's so condensed. And you, it forces you to kind of develop that plan and like have a very specific approach. I think it took me probably most of the time through the pro racing that I did to really learn that I had to have a plan for every specific session. I had to, I didn't even speak the language of data until halfway through running in World Challenge. You know, I, I couldn't even get on the computer because um, we had a MoTeC, we had a whatever the series mandated at the time. Um, and until really, my business partner and I started looking into Apex Pro and started getting serious about entering into the data space. I don't think I really invested the time to really like speak the language, you know, fluidly. And that really shaped how I, how I viewed data a lot. But um, if you're cool, then let's look at a couple of comments because we got some good ones here. Um, some good comments already. So Andy Smedegard hopped on and said, no matter what level of driver, everyone can benefit from coaching, which is probably the truest statement in the world. And I was going to ask you a question, Tom, because I've been asking myself this recently or someone asked me this recently and um, uh, someone asked if I had a coach, like I was coaching them and I was like, yeah, of course, you know, I've had multiple coaches, but um, Robbie Foley coached me a lot when I was doing world challenge and started out down and kind of doing pro bono stuff. And then eventually I kind of like didn't buy some tires and paid him to coach me because it was so beneficial. But I was wondering if you've had any like coaches in your life that were like very helpful um, or people that have taught you a lot? I don't, I've never had a coach um, or or been to a school or anything like that. The only moment of that that really stands out, and I have to think hard to make sure I don't discredit anybody, but the one that definitely stands out is um, within my first season of autocrossing, just based on like the concepts of autocross and how that works. I was used to racing video games, so I understood racing lines, and I knew like outside, inside, outside, and I was using every inch that I could possibly use on the autocross course. And I went to a, a, an event and a good friend of mine told me, just cut all the distance out, keep the car on the limit, do exactly the same thing you're doing. But instead of arcing all of these giant, you know, sweeping lines through the course, just cut the distance. And that was like a light bulb, boom, holy crap, I've just got so much faster. But after that, I think it's been a lot of self self-challenge or you know whatever whatever level I'm trying to operate at being challenged by the people around me and making sure that I can figure out how to do it um so no I've never really worked with anybody else in a formal coach but I feel like I've been coached by the people around me for a long time just in either challenging me to figure out how to be better or in giving the, you you get those little nuggets like we were talking about the community kind of comes around and you get four or five guys taught and then all of a sudden someone says something you're like oh yeah, yeah, and it clicks. So pick up those little things, and I think that maybe this that that is more of a grassroots level kind of operation. You know, like people are they're a little more willing to share, but there's also a, a, a more um, saturated community of drivers in grassroots racing. Where in pro racing, you have a driver and a team surrounding that driver. Right. And 
if the you know the whole team is sitting at dinner there's still only one guy that drove the car that day maybe yeah. two um so i think that maybe is more of a product of the way i came up in motorsports rather than anything else yeah i would love yeah. to i honestly that's a great point i feel like i should like just hire somebody for a day and see what happens you know yeah be cool I think I learned a lot from uh, from hiring Robbie because he uh, he knew he knew data a lot better than I did, and he just taught me how to think about the big picture a lot more than, you know, I was still a little bit too much focused on all brake or all throttle, you know, and and kind of this this the super simplistic way that you think about driving initially. It's just like go as fast as you can, right? And some of the simple intuitive things that kind of stem from that, and he kind of taught me to think about it from a a holistic perspective of of um, you know, kind of how to work that equation, corners where you want to run less distance or places where you want to keep the tire at the limit and average your speeds. It doesn't really matter if you're wide open throttle or not, if you're carrying as much speed as you can. And all those little kind of nuggets, I think um, I can kind of place on him. And then Mikey Taylor, who is a buddy of mine who races TCR now, he taught me some things. And then um, kind of like, uh, like you were mentioning, I actually rode dirt bikes a lot when I was younger. And one of my friends that I rode dirt bikes from was an instructor at the Porsche school at Barber who I ended up eventually after world challenge starting to work for and learned a lot about how to like actually teach people and kind of formally instruct. But he taught me how to ride a dirt bike kind of informally, like you would had just explained. And I think I just learned a lot about how I learned and kind of that like early stage, how you talk to people about coaching and instructing and stuff. Um, Chris Finnegan is wondering if you're doing only in-person coaching or uh, do you do any remote uh, data and video review? I've done a little bit of remote and interestingly, the one, the one like real formal remote session I've ever done with someone was actually for an autocross, which you guys are going to be tired of hearing about autocross by the end of this, I think, but, <laughs> but um, I, I kind of set up, it was, it was just this year. Um, there was a friend of mine who was running uh, an event in Charlotte and I couldn't go. So we figured out, you know, I basically set up a schedule to do a virtual course walk via FaceTime and then he would upload his autocross data and videos. And when they were uploaded, he would send me the links. I would look at everything, um, go through my process, you know, to review that without him there and then give him a call. And we would do a remote sync up after every um, run session, which it was a pro solo, which means you run three different times throughout the weekend and your best single time from any of those sessions count, um, which means it was productive for him to have those three sync ups throughout the weekend. Right. Whereas most autocrosses don't have that format, so it'd be a little more challenging, but it worked great. Um, and I've, I've certainly talked to other people or done a more informal, you know, here's some data and some video. Um, and I like to sync up with people I work with after the event if I can. Um, but I, I guess the, the remote stuff is certainly something that I've, I've looked at. I think it's a great idea. And it, it's obviously great for a racetrack too, because racetracks are very, I mean, they're the same every time for the most part, other than conditions. Yeah. So it's predictable rather than out across course. Your audio went, went away. Oh, no, it finally no, it's happened. Back. It's good. You're good. It's because I was getting boring. It, uh, it limits me. That's right. It, it just like chops in. It's like, no, that wasn't interesting enough. No, that's cool. Um, Chris, to answer your question, I've looked at some of Chris's data at NCM before, uh, actually. Uh, but I, I've done a lot of remote coaching as well, a very similar kind of um, format to Tom and it, it can be really effective. Uh, and it's, it's fairly simple for tracks as well, because if you know, if you're working with somebody who knows the track really well, they already are going to know some of the places you might struggle. And it's a, it's a quick process. Um, that's really cool though. That's kind of, um, you know, like with, with Ryan and I sitting here in the Apex Pro office, people send us data sessions all the time. And sometimes it's as easy as opening the app and doing a screen recording and just, manipulating the app and emphasizing a couple things and narrating what's going on and then sending that screen recording. Um, I have a client that I do that for whenever I can't be at the track with him. Um, and just, it takes me five minutes because I've, I already know his driving. I know his car. I know the tires he's on, you know, I know all the variables. And so it's just like, Hey, this is a little point of emphasis that you should work on. You know, this is what I'm seeing. It's not quite where we want it to be or whatever. Um, Matt Busby, uh, the man himself has a, uh, has a this one. Yeah, I saw it come up. Good question. But, so, Thomas, you've expanded your coaching toolbox. Have you noticed a pattern in driving styles? Definitely. Um, I was actually going to bring that up without even this question. Is uh, one of the first things I always ask someone is if they're kind of a right brain or left brain type of person. Like, are you a, are you a creative sense, you know, feeling based driver, or are you data driven? You need 
you know, proof and you think of things in a, in a process or an equation kind of thing, because I want to understand how someone thinks. And I'm, I'm more of the sensing, you know, feeling kind of thing. Um, but I like to think, I like to get in their head just a little bit and see what kind of thinker they are. What are you looking at? Is there one behind me? No. Oh, no, sorry. Ryan wrote something on the board for me to read. I was like nervous that Andy was thinking no, no, about no, you. You're good. Um, but uh, I mean, after that, I think I definitely find that there are people who they, I don't know that this necessarily relates to that or not, but there are people who they want to follow the rules of, of how to drive fast and they want to follow the line really cleanly. They want to be very precise. And at sometimes they, they don't insert what I call the hustle. Like they, they don't really hustle the car. They don't try to pursue speed at the expense of losing that precision. And then there are the opposite drivers who are willing to throw everything at the wall. They're not afraid of the car control. They're not afraid of going over the limit or spinning, but they don't have a lot of the precision or anything like that. So those drivers, you're kind of reining into the, the, the rules of driving. You know, you've got to be coming off the brake pedal cleanly, coming into the corners to roll your speed and stuff. But uh, is that loud? Not too bad. Um, and then the other drivers, it's, it, I've honestly found it harder to, to push people to add that hustle in. You know, you got to be, if you watch, I know um, there's some videos of like Lewis Hamilton is, he misses apexes like all the time but he's always on the limit and he's always maximizing the amount of speed the car can handle for the line that he ends up on. And that's nine times out of 10 faster than being a little bit under the limit, but being um, clean. So those are the two styles that I feel like I come across the most. And I feel like I have to attack the, either the add the hustle or add the precision. Yeah. And I haven't figured out how to add the, you know, the, the biggest challenge, like how do you, how do you, how do you add push somebody to yeah, to dirty it up a little bit, you know, to drive yeah. the car hard because Absolutely. yeah, there's consequences sometimes, but you got to, if you're strategic about it and you're adding that little bit of, of aggression in the right places and working the car in the, in, and especially with these drivers that are at these grassroots events that are really, they're already kind of at the limit of what the car can do, but you've got to get that extra bit, especially on street tires, you're starting to do neutral steer, you're starting to ride the slip angle of tire a lot more. I think we were talking about this with, uh, with your car specifically at turn 10 at NCM. It's like, there's a level of, you know, you, you scrub the precision, you scrub, you've got to, you know, just push the car harder somehow um, and, and extract the speed that way. Um, that one's really hard to coach on. I haven't, I haven't cracked that code yet consistently. That one's about, you know, the driver in the actual car, adding that in and feeling it and trusting it, trusting themselves really. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, man. I couldn't, I, I can't relate to anything more than what you just said, because it's, I haven't, I, I, having similar experiences with looking at a lot of people's data and a lot of people's driving and being paid to think about how they can get better at it. Um, I haven't noticed necessarily that there's like a style from the standpoint of how they use the inputs, but it's more so their mindset or their personality that, that generates that either, you know, kind of throwing stuff at the wall and driving fast, kind of that right, you know, sensing kind of mindset, which is kind of how I always, uh, a little bit more on that side of it, I think personally as well. And then having to add in the hustle to the really precise analytical driver. And those are, I also find it to be a lot harder to ask somebody to hustle more. And I think that's the, that's the big challenge. And um, Matt, if you're still listening, what, what Tom was talking about in turn 10 was like, when he drove my car, our data in turn 10 was like this much different, like crazy, crazy different. And it was just me not being comfortable and not trusting the tire and just frankly it was just like i know this is a really slow corner i've got to go really slow and get a good exit and totally totally screwing my entry speed and, and not getting enough rotation in the car and, and still not getting on the power early because of it um but you're coming on street tires particularly like a hankook rs4 or another street tire that really you feel like you're driving it beyond the limit when it's going its fastest and it's not necessarily abusing the tire. It's actually kind of happy there and you have to kind of manage it. I find it to be really hard to encourage people that aren't, ne aren't naturally the type of driver to drive a little beyond the limit and then rein it back in. Um, I'm working with one client in particular right now, and that's what we've been working on is talking through. He's very much so analytical, super, super that like left brain just like needs to know exactly what the tire should feel like, what it should be communicating to him and all these things. And it's very, very hard to explain that when you don't just trial and error, it kind of get it wrong. And, uh, and yeah, I know um, I was also recently working with someone who was um, 
they have a, a racing traction control in their car, so it's not super annoying. But um, when I drive, I drove the car with him without it, and I preferred it without. Any, anyway, long story. But um, he was like, you know, next year I think is when I really want to turn it off. So I'm gonna I'll finish off this year, and and I'll, I'll next year my thing is I'm gonna turn off my traction control. And we that kind of prompted a conversation about pushing limits, and um, basically shared a story of when I started racing. Um, I bought a car that everybody and their mother told me when I bought this car, it is flat through turn one. You just, you just turn and you just go. And the first time I went to mid Ohio, I'm thinking about like, I'm supposed to go flat and turn one in this car. And it was like an 80 horsepower civic. Um, so they weren't lying, but I had done a couple of laps of, you know, you you tap the brakes and then you just lift and I'm getting to the point where I'm like, I I have to, I have to try. There's been no indication that the car is going to do anything crazy. Like I, everyone has told me it should be able to go flat through there. Um, and the lap that I knew that I was going to try it, I had a pit in my stomach and I was so scared, but I did it. And the first lap, it was a little sloppy. It was like, I got a big slide and I think I was, you know, probably not on the apex or anything, but I lived, I was fine. I didn't spin, but I knew that I didn't execute it very well either. So the next lap I go in and I, the pit was gone and I was cleaner and cleaner. And then by the end of, you know, qualifying or whatever, every lap, boom, 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 no problem. But I absolutely remembered and remember sympathizing with with the person I was working with, like the pit in the stomach of the first time you're going to try something that you haven't tried yet and you're not comfortable with, especially when someone else is telling you that it is okay to do that or you should be doing yeah. that. It's like, yeah, I wasn't being coached necessarily, but I was being told by everybody around me, this car needs to go flat through there. And it was really scary to try it. But um, even if you don't try it the first time, obviously there's, there's a fine line between that, but um, I'm thinking of if if you or I are coaching somebody to break at the three board and they've been breaking at the four and breaking at the four and breaking at the four and they try the three the first time and it's a mess, don't not try it again just because, you know, if if you've got the data and the support to tell you that that you've got to work on yeah. adding that hustle, but then like you said, kind of braining it back to being super consistent because that's the fine line between, it, it, it's kind of disciplinary too. So a time attack driver doesn't have to be consistent lap after lap after lap where you know we in wheel to wheel do um but you're not going to nail it the first time when your coach tells you you can do x thing you got to keep working on that and it's okay if it's dirty for a little bit or it's okay if it's a little bit sloppy for a little bit because the repetition of doing that at the limit is going to eventually clean itself up as you're working on it yeah absolutely and and a lot of times what makes the difference between a good coach and maybe a great coach or a, a better coach is that um you know how you can remember as a driver, what it was like to go through that experience and what you felt. And you can maybe even remember what people told you. Like it's, it's not super empowering when someone does that. Like they just come up to you and like, Oh yeah, that car's flat through turn one. And now you're standing there and you're like, okay, I've got to be flat through turn one. There's now this expectation. A good coach doesn't expect that of you. They give you the, they, they, they make you believe within, with a reasonable, from where you are now, breaking at the one board a little bit in turn one in mid-Ohio, they make you believe that there's a reasonable way for you to go flat through that turn. And they help you believe it. And sometimes that's like a slow climb. And sometimes it happens all at once, but it's a good coach doesn't say things like that. They, they say things that are empowering. And that's the difference between sometimes learning from the community and, and learning from somebody who's intentionally trying to support your, your growth as the delivery is going to change your it might not even be scary you might just do it just because now you believe you can do it and you don't even think about it but i am um, i had the exact same experience in matt williams fit at uh, mid ohio because i I never driven mid ohio i don't i don't know how i've never driven i've been there like five times never turned laps at mid ohio i've always either coached there or worked on a pit crew or something and so i drove matt's fit for the first time and he was telling me it's flat through turn one you know and i'm like yeah it probably is yeah you know but I've never been through turn one in mid Ohio. I'm not flat. You know, the whole first session, I did like four laps the first session. I didn't, I wasn't flat, but I drove it again on Sunday. And, and I kind of had to have that like internal, I looked at Matt's data. He sent me his apex pro data. I looked at it. I was like, yeah, it's flat. It's easy, flat. It's not a big deal. Just turn in at the right point, you know? And, and then I just did it and it was like, oh yeah, car moves around a little bit. It's fine. Right. And it's like, you have that I don't know. It's a, that's not an easy process to walk through. Even, even now that I've got years and years and years of driving experience and a lot of coaching experience, that's still not easy to do. And it, and it never is for anybody, but it's, it's that just, um, 
belief, you know, like, yeah, it's going to be okay. What's the worst that could happen? I straighten my hands and run off, you know, and then come back on. That's probably the worst that's going to happen, right? Um, so are there, are there any questions you want me to get to, Ryan, while we're, while we're here? You guys are probably seeing Ryan Finch commenting like a madman on the uh, on the stream, but we'll we'll take this opportunity for anybody who's joining in. We've had a solid like 30, 40 live viewers since we started. So thanks for watching, everybody. Make sure to like it, share it to anywhere that's relevant. Hit the love button at the top or the wow face that helps uh, and ask your questions in the comments. We've already worked our way through most of the questions so far, um, and we'll we'll get to those uh, in just a second. But um, that folks be called up about um uh, Matt. Great, how important that is and then another big one was Cortland here said I love watching you I know I'm trying to get comfortable uh with a little bit of grip on the track I have no problem doing it all across but of course you know it's, hmm. uh, it's more of a mental block about spinning or going off at the track okay um cool so uh that's a, that's a good question I don't know if you heard that one Tom but um Ryan said there's a question and I actually don't see it my it's like my comment stream is way behind where everything is everything's coming in afterwards but there's a question that said i i'm confident driving the car at the limit on an autocross presumably have a little more autocross experience but i can't quite translate that to the track yet um and have a little bit of a mental block so maybe that's a good tee off into our autocross conversation that's a that's a tricky one because that is not exactly a challenge that i found for myself but i I don't know why I didn't find that for myself. So that's why it's really hard. I find a lot of the coaching that I'm doing is based on personal experience. And um, I'm trying to think of a really good answer. The first thing I think of immediately is that it, your, your visual habits on track may not be very good, um, only because you're probably going at a higher speed where you're feeling more uncomfortable. And as, as you get uncomfortable at speed, your vision tends to shrink like this and you tend to look down more um, and you tend to um, also, I find people cheat into corners a lot. They'll start to turn in earlier um, and basically limit the amount of space they both see and can use. So I find if you're struggling with the amount of speed you're comfortable carrying on track, you're probably not seeing truly the amount of space you have to use. Um, so that's kind of a visual reset of challenging yourself when you go on a track to, uh, well, first, of all, not physically cheat into corners and limit the amount of space you can use on specifically entries, but sometimes exits as well. But also, I like, um, there was an autocross school I used to teach that I really liked the verb or the terms they used. It was um, break, look, and turn. So as soon as you break, you should no longer be looking at where you're aimed for the breaks. You should be looking into the corner or ideally to the exit of that corner because that's where you're going to end up. And the further down the track you can be looking, as soon as you hit the brakes, there's always, you know, I'm thinking of a, a true braking zone. There's always an amount of time where you're not really doing much. I mean, there's a little bit of brake finesse that's happening there, but you have a time to realize the amount of space you're working with. And um, if you're uncomfortable because you're now going 100 to 110 miles an hour instead of on an autocross course and you're, you're looking like this, you're not looking at the exit of the corner, you don't see the space you have to work with, and you get uncomfortable with the amount of speed you're carrying right now. Versus if you were, you know, your vision's like this, you're finding the exit of the corner and you see the amount of space you have to work with subconsciously you're immediately going to be more comfortable because you're not worried about what's happening with the car underneath you but then you can also be consistently aware of where the car is going to end up and you can kind of strategically push that limit more and more and more by breaking a little bit later using brake markers picking kind of a, a relatively consistent turn in point and if you're hitting that turn in point and missing the apex you know you're going too quick you know that that starts to get the whole big conversation but the first thing i thought of i was just reading it as he was reading it out loud too is to challenge yourself the next time you go on track to really pay attention to what your eyes are doing and force them to, like I said, break, look, and turn. And as soon as you hit the brakes, you should look to the exit. As soon as you get committed to the corner, look to the next corner and try to convince yourself, if there's not a better word for it, convince yourself that there is more space to use. Mm -hmm. And outside of that, I think that that will help you feel more comfortable at speed versus like on an autocross course, the relative speeds are between 30 and 55 miles an hour for most of the course. So you're not really ever that uncomfortable and you have a lot less space to look for because the corners are a lot smaller. So it's a lot easier to look around and it's a lot easier to feel comfortable with the speed versus hitting the brakes at 120 or what, however fast your car is, Cortland. Uh, when you go to the brakes on a really fast corner or a really big corner or something like that. I don't know, do you have any thoughts? I yeah, no, that I, I think that's exactly it. It's like the... Um there's an element of, of like conservation 
that you have to expect from yourself when you're on the racetrack because your your body like humans weren't designed to travel through space at 100 miles per hour you know whenever like when when you know our species is evolving right it's not like we're computers that are designed to be traveling at high rates of speed so you have to kind of combat a lot of your natural tendencies which are going to be that more like you know lowered vision not looking up where you need to and and i think i mean fundamentally it's not some for some people it's easier than others and i don't have a reason or explanation why but some people have that problem and some people just don't um and sometimes it's something as simple as just asking yourself while you're on track trying to consciously think about where you're looking and just have a trigger to remind yourself that like if you have somebody on the radio with you it's really easy like even if you just have a friend or a family member or somebody like if you have a car with radios ask them to to remind you just eyes up um, but I mean, my, my trigger word is focus when I notice my vision is dropping, because if I tell myself focus for some reason, that's the right, I just say it out loud in my helmet and that helps my vision elevate. So if you're struggling with that transition from autocross to road racing, just remember that you're eclipsing a lot more distance at higher speed. And therefore your, your vision doesn't have to go like twice as far down the road. It has to go like on a logarithmic scale further down the road. It has to go a lot further at, at those higher rates of speed because you're, you're traveling, you're covering so much more distance. So there's definitely a, diff a difference in the visual discipline. Um, even though with autocross as well, you should get really used to that whole turning your head, looking out the passenger window, you know, craning your neck around, you know, um, hands following your eyes kind of, kind of approach. Um, Ryan, what was the first thing you wanted me to mention? Uh, Rami from UMI? Rami. Rami. He okay. uh, was wondering who was the number one qualifier at King of the Mountain 1.0. That's a trivia question to interrupt the whole thing. And I think I know. Oh, you want to the segue for you. Do you want to come say uh, hi on the camera, Mr. Number One Qualifier? Yeah, he wanted to know if you knew who it was. He said, "Hint, you know him." Yeah, sitting just to your right. Oh, this guy, Ryan Finch. That's why he wanted me to bring it up. I get it. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll you yeah, that's right. We'll talk about the, the event coming up at, at UMI as we get into the autocross conversation. But um, Tom, what we talked about last night was how, um, you know, so I, I, I started out autocrossing when I was probably about the same age as you, probably 16. I actually had a guy I sat next to in home ec, had a base model automatic Civic. And we were cooking brownies one day, you know, in home ec. And he was talking about going to the event. And I'd gone out and watched a couple of autocrosses and I, he let me come co-drive his car. And uh, it, I did really well. I won novice packs and I was like, oh man, I'm the king of the world. And that's what kind of started my whole, uh, my whole journey. But I hadn't really done much autocrossing since then. Um, I did do Formula SAE when I was at Auburn. So I drove the, the, um, this, this car right here. I had my hands backwards. So it's like a purpose-built autocross car, basically. So I did a lot of autocrossing for like a three-year period where I was driving this like 400 pound, 90 horsepower, you know, a mod speed autocross car essentially. Um, and got a ton of reps and testing and we put different dampers on the car and do all sorts of crazy cool stuff. But I haven't autocrossed in like 10 years. And so I went with Ryan a few weeks ago to an autocross here at, at Barber Motorsports Park. And it was really, one, I was surprised how quickly I remembered that I like recalibrated my brain for it. Cause it is different than driving on the track. You know, you can be a lot quicker with your hands, you know, you have to just do things a little bit differently. Um, but what I didn't calibrate was the speed versus distance equation as well. I did in some places, but in some places I really didn't. And where Ryan ended up being faster than me were all places where he ran less distance than I did, which I knew would be the reason because you get so used to driving on the racetrack. And so that's kind of what, what I wanted to mention, which was for those road racers, you know, folks that are watching, most of us are, are track day and racers and HPDE folks. And we're really used to speed, you know, radius equals speed and, you know, outside, inside, outside, all that classic road racing stuff. When we go to an autocross, the equation is different because the speeds are lower and there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes into that. But can you talk about Tom, like how you use your extensive autocross background and like transition that to, to make it an advantage in road racing and not a disadvantage? Cause I think some people see it as a, I've heard people talking about it. Like it's a disadvantage to be a big time autocrosser and go to road racing. And I certainly know as a road racer, I wouldn't stand a chance going to autocross nationals and competing without going and doing a lot of it. So can you talk about that like difference in the transition maybe? And then it's just kind of interesting. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, so I did maybe two or three track days in the seven years that I was autocrossing. So I went, I went from like heavy, hardcore autocross mentality to buying a road race car and having to kind of convert over. Um, and cha challenges first, the first thing that I learned is my hands were way too fast. I was like getting to a turn in point and just whipping the car in. And I was upsetting the car consistently all like just making the car go loose for no reason all the time. And I had to really slow my hands down. And the other thing is I would default to a, a cutting line or a cutting distance type of line mm -hmm. in, in moments where I told the story of the guy that told me to cut distance instead of take a racing line. I had to undo that again and get back to taking a racing line. Um, but because I transitioned really quickly from autocrossing to road racing without a whole lot of track driving in the middle, um, one of the things I found is I was way more comfortable adapting to different lines in a wheel to wheel racing environment than I was, yeah. than other people were around me. Um, so anytime I ended up in a situation where I was not necessarily on the normal driving line, I was still very comfortable with keeping the car at the limit. And that paired with having a momentum driven car in the class I was racing in, I ended up in those situations a lot and I had to, to be successful. And I think because autocross forces you to think about things outside of autocross in general is a very like cerebral, like there's not a fixed thing about it. You have to work in concepts. Um, so you're working in concepts of cutting distance. You're working in concepts of, of um, you know, you can't use braking markers and things like that. You have to be yeah. a little bit more thoughtful about it than that, or a little bit more. Yeah. Philosophical. I don't know the words. Philosophical is a good word for it. Yeah, exactly. Metaf so, metaphorical because it's not set in stone. It's, it's exactly. Different. And I think drivers who drive on racetracks a lot or learn to drive in the context of driving on a racetrack with reference points and things like that, there is a there's a rigidity to the way they do the things that they're doing. That when you insert that then into wheel to wheel, if you're not on the normal line, you're not used to, you're going to overslow more. You're going to you're going to back it down more to maintain control of your car. Eight and nine out of ten drivers do that. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Versus a driver that is comfortable with adapting and thinking in those you know philosophical cerebral terms, whatever it is. It's like, I know how to keep the car on the limit. I'm going to just do it a little bit differently this time. Um, so I think that autocross, uh, I honestly regretted autocrossing as long as I did for a period. I felt like oh, I'm just going to be an autocrosser. The autocross is till I'm 70. And I really wanted to road race. And I, re But then when I got to road racing, I realized, and, dri and driving on track, I realized how much I had done for myself by doing it for so long. Um, and the other thing is I was much quicker to get to the speed that I was able to get to on a track when I got to the track. Um, so the first season I raced, I raced at five different tracks and I was basically up to speed by the end of practice at every single one, even though I'd only driven one of the five before. And I think that autocross, because you only at the national level, I had gotten used to doing three runs at a time in a day, and then you get a new course. Mm -hmm. um, if you run across locally, you'll get, I don't know, six to 10 or whatever, however many you guys got. But when you only have those small amounts of time to see the course, um, then it is what it is. You really have to get good at maximizing and taking bigger swings rather than chipping away at those small, you know, to go from the five board to the two board that takes three laps and autocross, you don't, you are, you're already done. So you, you've got to get, you know, there pretty quickly. Um, and I learned that that was going to be a huge strength being able to get up to speed quickly and even transitioning into pro racing. I remember at the beginning of the pro weekends, you'd be like, well, you know, I'm, I'm going as fast as I'm going to go on lap four um, sometimes, not all the time, but other people take more time to get <laughs> to that point. And then by the time we get to the race, everyone's still on the same playing field, but it's just, there's something about the way that you have to think about autocross, think about the approach of a session. I think about it now is, you know, I kind of adapted this. If I can't put the car on pole in three laps, I'm not doing good enough. And that was a personal challenge to me because that comes from the world of autocross where you get three looks at a course and you got to be, you got to win or you, you don't yeah. win. Uh, yeah. So um, <laughs> that, that mentality transitioned really well into success on a, on a, you know, specifically a road racing scale or maybe time attack. Um, but then dialing back the speed of my hands, dialing back the way or dialing out the way I'm using the space on the track, they were like equal challenges to success points throughout yeah. the first years that I was doing that. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I think, I think I personally didn't do enough 
competitive autocross events because Formula SAE, the format was a little different. There was like an autocross event and then an endurance event that was like an autocross course that you lapped. Um, and that was typically the stronger event for me. Usually the other driver that I co-drove with, who was also probably 70 pounds lighter than me in a 400 pound car, had like half a second advantage just naturally because he's like, you know, 20% less of the, of the car's weight. But um, he was typically stronger in that regard. And so that's something that I've always struggled with that I think doing more competitive autocross events would train. And I think that's one of the biggest things that I see with the drivers who have that left brain tendency of having to be really precise and they develop a rigidity to their track driving. It's, it's those people that I think would benefit an enormous amount. I think everybody will, but enormous amount from, from autocrossing where you start to learn that you have to work in these, in these concepts. And I, I tell people all the, all the time, I, I teach a novice classroom for the local Porsche club group. And first of all, most of them have never autocrossed before. It's just people who have a sports car and they get talked into doing a HPDE. And so the, every single classroom, it's, you're going to go find an autocross. I'll even pull up like motorsport reg and be like, here are all the autocrosses nearby. There's a million of them. You guys need to go do these. Um, and we'll just kind of talk through why that's, it's so, it's so, so fundamental to everything, but it's also a really, really fun environment. Um, the only part of autocross I don't like is working the course. I like everything else. But that's that's true, the, yeah, I think that's the last thing I left off. I mean, there's there's definitely an aspect of because autocross is strictly exists in context of competition, whereas you can go drive on a track for your entire life and never actually compete. You you start to get, um, you know, the competitive edge in you comes out no matter what, because there is at the end of the day, always a results sheet at the end of an autocross. Um, so whether you care about it is one thing or not. But if you do care about it, you're driven to push yourself against that measure because there is truly a measure where at the track if you're not competing the only way to get a measure is to have you know data running in your car and either you challenge yourself or get a coach to challenge you or something like that yeah um yeah. but it, i think it, it forces a, a mentality of learning uh so a driver that becomes good at autocross has challenged themselves to get that way whereas a driver that goes on track is not always challenged in that way so I think it benefits you to be a little bit more self-motivated as well. Um, but also there's still nothing, like I go to autocrosses for fun because there's still the ratio of times that I leave an autocross with the shakes, you know, this, the adrenaline versus the time I leave a racetrack is still almost 100% at an autocross and maybe 25 in a on a racetrack, maybe. That's generous. So there's like the hit. I always say it's like doing 10 burpees rather than a 5K. Yeah. It's just like, there's nothing quite like it, you know? Totally. I, I had that experience when Ryan and I went a few weekends ago. It was like in between runs, I had more adrenaline pumping than I felt in a long time, you know, and it's, it's, you, you can get so comfortable with what you do on the racetrack and you don't have to adapt nearly as much. You don't have to, you don't have the intensity level. Yeah. It's the whole like weightlifting versus cardio comparison, you know, autocross is just like, you know, go do a, you know, just bench press as much weight as you possibly can once, you know, and, and you're done. Um, and it really forces you to be, to, to, to get everything out of that run and really pushes that competitive edge. So if, if you're watching this and you're like, I'm that hardcore HPDE guy that you're talking about, you know, like that's me. If you're putting yourself in that box right now, really consider your, consider some autocrossing, um, go to a regional event or, or challenge yourself and find some friends that are going to the more competitive events, because even at the regional level, there's going to be guys that are fast and, and people that you can compete with and, it really forces that competitive edge and it gives you a reason to understand what the tire's doing and what the car is doing a lot more so than just driving on track. It's I've, I've ridden with so many drivers on track that have either hired me or that I've, um, you know, just doing like pro bono coaching before I kind of built a client base and built a business around it. Um, you know, guys that would go out and, and they would drive, you know, on, on cold tires, the same way that they would with the exact same inputs and the exact same brake pressure and the exact same visuals as they would when the tires are up to temp, you know, and we'd end up sliding through a corner and it would freak them out, you know? And it's like, well, you, you have to adapt, like you got to drive a little differently when the tires are cold, you know, you have to adapt, you got to be a little softer and then, and then bring up the intensity level. But it's like those, those mistakes and all the times that you see people at HPDs crush a concrete wall because they made it, they made a mistake. A lot of that can be alleviated by just autocrossing more regularly and because I it's say I, I, sorry, go ahead. I was just saying it's a lot easier to push the limits at 50 miles an hour you know and okay. explore the car and I would piggyback onto that something that I specifically this year I've gotten to experience more is um, 
kind of like car control and drifting talk about that. Um, just by oh no, am I back? Yep, you're back. Uh, I was just... talking about drifting. That's not boring. My computer got that wrong. But um, <laughs> getting getting to ex getting exposed to other types of events as well. Like I started doing drifting for work. I was doing a a, a job where I was giving rides, and a lot of it was drifting. Um, back in 2017 on, but I never did it for fun until this year hanging out with the ASM guys. I've gotten to go to a couple of those. And I, I made a video, I don't, it's, I posted it on Instagram and stuff, but last weekend I made a huge miscalculation. I tried too hard and I ended up splashing through a puddle in the rain and then spinning off the track in into the grass and into the gravel. Um, in, at the, the first lap of the rain race, the last race of the weekend. Um, and I don't know, I don't know what happened in my brain while it was happening, but I got the car through the gravel trap and back onto the track pointed in the right direction without more than like 10 to 12 seconds worth of lost time. And I realized after that race, kind of talking about how dumb it was, that I've been going to these drifting events and intentionally 360ing a car over and over and over to the point that we're doing it consistently to a stop in a box and you know practicing the precision car control while completely out of control in a way. And I would like to think that I only got through the gravel trap and out without losing more than 15 seconds because I had been intentionally spinning cars for a couple of months before that. Um, so when it happened by accident, you know, my little brain put the two and two together and knew what to do with the wheel. Either that or I got super lucky. I don't know. But I think you can kind of challenge yourself in those different types of events. And it's been super fun to watch as we, we've been putting on a couple of events like that. Um, we call them driver's ed, but it's not actually... We're not necessarily teaching anybody. We're giving them the opportunity to come to this event in a low consequence environment. And a bunch of autocrossers will show up and we have some drift elements set up. And at the beginning of the event, they're autocrossing the course. And by the end of the event, they're yanking e-brakes and hanging the back end out and trying stuff. Um, and that, that'll, even if it's not productive to going faster on a racetrack in it's not faster to drift, it will help you down the line, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree with that more. I think I take for granted a lot of times that I, I spent probably three days a week on a skid pad teaching people at Porsche on a like a low grip surface. I had to go wet it in. I had to do the demo. I had to take people for rides and got used to the car sideways constantly in, in that kind of environment. And I think that's something that kind of like, like you were saying, you drifted for work. I never really thought about it. I was just like, this is just what we do. But it's it's helped me a lot um, just with that comfort level of, of being at the limit. Um, Ryan, do we have anything uh, questions wise that we've missed? I have one I like. Uh -oh. You yeah, can serve it up. My, my questions so, aren't like mine doesn't load. I don't even have them in front of me. It's like they're only questions from 20 minutes ago. We kind of called you out a little bit. Michael Trask said, yeah, but you can learn from working the course though. Watch people's lines and braking. And I think he's totally right. Like when I learned how to work a course, we're still talking about autocross, but when, when I learned how to work a course, as a study exercise, rather than just the thing that I was supposed to go do to be able to autocross, you can totally see things that are working. You can see things that aren't working. So that the time by the time you drive, uh, and I've I've now adapted that over to to racing as well uh, to to driving on track. You know, I like to watch car outside of car video. If I can play it in a simulator, even I'm watching outside of car video, or I'll go stand on the hill in Mid Ohio and watch the outside of the car and see. You know what what is somebody doing so what are the successful guys doing you can watch it at a pro race and see what are the front runners doing versus what are the, the back markers doing and you can pick up all that stuff by studying proactively rather than just standing there and having to work the cores yeah just kidding. i like that one though he, he made a super good point no that was good i know mike too uh i appreciate the shade mike i, I probably deserve it yeah i think i'm probably complaining about it because how hot was it the day that we went it was like refill 100 degrees humidity bugs yeah i was like back at the auto of course it was like i got out there and i'm like watching everybody drive the course and i'm getting bit by all these bugs and stuff and i'm like okay we're gonna we're gonna go to one in the fall next time <laughs> <laughs> yeah good point yeah it was it was awesome though but you're right you you learn a lot um i spent a lot of time at porsche um with some of the like higher level courses that we did like trackside coaching so we would just go stand at a corner and take notes and show some of the other drivers what people were doing and you really quickly learn, you know, you, you notice stuff like the, the gap between the tire and the fender when a drive, when a car is braking, you know, decreases obviously on the front. And then you can kind of watch the rate of release and you can see if they just pop off the brake, that gap grows back. Right. 
Um, and you can obviously watch brake lights and just the attitude of the car and how close they're getting to things. And if curbs upset it, there's so much that I always thought it was funny that at a pro race weekend, like a, a pro race weekend versus like a, um, an HPD, it's like two ends of the spectrum at a pro race weekend. It was like every weekend we went from driving on track to like watching two or three other sessions on track, you know, on the fence, like in world challenge, I'd always go watch the GT cars, you know, just to get a sense for where they're putting the car, what they might be avoiding all the little things that you just mentioned. And then I went to HPDs for years and just driving around the track and working with clients, not understanding why nobody's standing on the side of the track, watching another run group, you know, cause you learn so much, you pick up so much little anecdotal information that all kind of needs to go into that equation to, to allow you to go fast. Um, I just always thought that was interesting. So I, I do that a lot. I take, if someone hires me for the day that will spend an entire two or three sessions during a day just track side at different places, getting different vantage points and recognizing things that you'll, you'll never recognize at speed in the car, kind of like a track walk. Um, there's just, there's so much to it, but I think the, the kind of crux of it is, I don't think there's a downside to autocrossing for road racing at all. And, and I've heard people talk about it like there is, and I really don't know what it is. It's, I think there's a, a downside to being a strict, rigid road racer and then going to autocross, like you're going to have a lot of, you're going to have a lot of uh, things that you have to overcome. And there's going to be a lot of habits that you have to kick and you're going to have to challenge the car a lot more. And you're going to have to work in these kind of concepts instead of this rigid construct. So I think that's a much harder transition, but I, I feel like once autocrossers adapt their vision, slow down the wheel rate, it's a, it's a, it's a really good starting point. And to your, to your point, Tom, as well, for wheel to wheel, like I'm pretty sure, and I could be wrong. I think Jeremy Swenson coming into GLTC, I don't know that he really had any wheel to wheel experience before this year, but he was a really, really solid autocrosser. And it's like he's been wheel to wheel racing his whole life. I mean, I'm sure he's, I'm sure there's things that you've noticed racing around him. You can probably tell that he's not been doing it a ton, but, but he got up to speed like that and can run anywhere on the track and be comfortable. And I think that's how a lot of autocrossers are, just like you were going to road racing. Um, I just see so many more pros for road racers to go do some autocross when they're not at the track or build it into their schedule. Then I, then I see cons. There's just not any cons really. Except for, uh, I guess it's not the most dignified day. You know, you, you go to the standard Ooh. parking lot for the, Oh no. Am I back oh, now? There you go. Yep. Yep. Just uh, like I said, it's not necessarily the most dignified day. Yeah. You're going to a parking lot. You're driving around relatively slow, but when you say it that way, it sounds miserable, but it's not that way at all, you know? So yeah. I think there's um, not necessarily ego, but there's something to that. There's, I'm yeah. not going to go do that. But yeah. I, I, I think you're right. They're lost. It's, it's super, super productive to do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I know that now that I, I have a buddy's car that I can co-drive with, uh, with Ryan sitting right here, I'll probably be, be going to more autocross events, picking, you know, just picking his brain and asking him, you know, it was like, I'm sure it was like him having a toddler or something because I'm there and I'm like, Hey dad, tell me, you know, because it's been so long since I've been to an autocross and he competes at such a high level in autocross that it was, it was, uh, it was funny, but I'm, I had a little bit of that, like, and I sensed it in myself going to it. Cause I'm like, I don't want to work the course. It's going to be hot. I only want to be there for half the day, which I did only stay for half the day, but you know, I'm like, why do I have this attitude towards auto? Like I caught myself with that attitude towards like, I, I know that standing there watching all these other cars drive through the course is going to help me more than, than anything else. You know, so I think there is like an attitude adjustment that you just kind of have to be like, I need to do this for me. You know, it's, it's fun and it's going to be a foundational experience because it's when you're learning to drive, I, I tell people, so like the, the drivers that have to learn the hustle, the thing that I always come back to is there are no rules. Like there, 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 there's some things that are like the laws of physics apply, right? The laws of physics are really the only rules. Um, and we, we kind of extrapolate those laws of physics into some things that are kind of fundamental truths, but even the things that are fundamental truths can be kind of warped and shaped and used differently. And I think in autocross, because you have to adapt so much to the course, you have to know what those kind of fundamental truths are and how to manipulate them. And when in certain courses, cutting distance is the key. And then sometimes it's maybe high enough speed that you do want to carry the extra distance because you're going so much faster or whatever. Um, I think that just trains that that element. Um, but tell us about, there's a big autocross coming up and I know that's you're racing this weekend at Heartland park with GLTC. And then you've got this autocross coming up. So tell us a little bit about what Tom's doing coming up soon. And then we'll talk a little bit about how people can reach out to you and, um, hire you for coaching and engage with you at events and all that kind of stuff. 
So there's uh, the event that's coming up is put on by uh, UMI Performance and it's called King of the Mountain. It's the third time they've done it. And then there was another event that was put on similarly. Um, and it started three years ago um, and they put a $10,000 purse on a bracketed autocross. So you compete down, you know, like NBA bracket down to a winner and the winner won 10 grand. And uh, obviously that caught my attention. Um, it was invitational only. I don't think I was invited the first year, but I was invited the second year. And I, I never had a car to do it. So I, I wanted to, but last year it went and passed. And I'm, the first year, Jeremy Swenson won, uh, who you just mentioned. The second year, the guy who just walked in the shop back there won, Andy. Um, and last year when they announced this $25,000 autocross that happened in Texas, I'm like, man, I, I think a stock NSX could win. I really do. And I had autocrossed an NSX before and I thought it was going to be not great. And it was phenomenal. It was so, so good. So I went back to, to HPD and that didn't quite happen fast enough. I asked a little too late, but I kept it in, in my mind. And the guys at UMI saw this other 25K autocross pop up. So this year they're putting on a $25,001 autocross. So it's the <laughs> highest paying autocross ever. Um, and it's the same thing. It's, it's basically street tires only, invitational only for all of the fastest cars and drivers that they can think to invite. Um, so there's a lot of older cars, a lot of newer cars. They're all bracketed out by class, and then they compete down to a final four and run off for, um, I think the purses are split out just a little bit, but I think the overall winner wins like 15K, and then you can win more by other things too. Um, so I went back to Acura earlier this time, and I said, I really think that a stock NSX could win this event, and I would like to try. Um, and oh, by the way, SCCA Autocross Nationals are the next week. So can I have it for two weeks? And can I try to win the two biggest autocrosses in the country in the same 10 days with the same stock car? Cool. Um, and they liked that idea. So they're willing to loan me a, I get a 2020 NSX delivered here next week um, and basically throw an alignment and some tires on it and take it to UMI. And we'll come back. And then Andy and I are going to co-drive it at Solo Nationals and try to win both of them. Um, so I'm really excited about that. And I always was thinking about it kind of ironically, you know, I've gotten to be as close to a professional race car driver as anybody can say they are. I was paid to race for a while and the opportunity to make the most money I've ever made in motorsports is all the way back in my roots in autocrossing. <laughs> I mean, that's like kind of wild. So it should be fun. I have zero expectations, but high hopes and we'll see what happens. Yeah, that's super cool. I remember uh, seeing and maybe listening to a couple of podcasts talking about those like high purse autocross is like, man, there's nothing like that in the road racing world. It's just not, it's not quite there yet. Yeah. I mean, it, the closest thing to it is, I guess, like a Friday night lights, you know, the big purse races they have at oval tracks around the country. We, us in road racing are like, they get to, they yeah. win how much, they win how many thousands to win this little circle track race Yeah, in our brains. But yeah, I made like $800 one time at a world challenge race. It was awesome. <laughs> yeah. I think that I was the best part about B-Spec. It was so cheap. You actually made money on the contingent or the uh, yeah. persons they paid out. Yeah. The first year that I did World Challenge in 2015, there were when there were three races a weekend, you know, it was like five grand a race to win. Um, and then we had contingency from Volkswagen at the time. It wasn't a very strong contingency program. But if you if you swept a weekend, it was a net positive weekend, which was a, that definitely does not exist anymore. And of course, our cars were flying pieces of garbage. So that never that never would have happened, but I was going to go into another story about my, my first pro race, which was at most sport, which was kind of speaking to like that adaptability element, like never been to the track, had to figure it out. Car broke red flag. The first practice session of my first pro race, my first time on the track was in qualifying in the car and just had to figure it out and qualified like sixth out of 15 or 20 cars. You know, it was like, but that's a whole different, that's a whole different conversation. But Tom, how can people that want to engage with you for coaching or, um, video data review or maybe want to get with you at an event uh to do some of the to start kind of a coaching relationship and have you drive their car do what all what all you do how can they reach out to you sure so ryan's been very generous in posting links so there should be links re relatively recently in the chat there you just got it right away um so everything we do uh for the full season with grid life and a couple other select events we do through asm so you can visit that link in the in the um, chat for ASM coaching, we posted a schedule of everything we're doing there. And then if you're looking for events that maybe aren't on that list, you can still get a hold of us and we can easily uh, at least look at our calendars and see where we can come. Um, and outside of that, I try to go to as many events as I can and be at the track as often as I can. So if you see me walking around, you can grab me at any time. You can shoot me a message. Um, 
either through that link or just on Facebook or wherever else, Instagram, you want to message me, I will, I will respond and try to make it work. Um, if you want to do it at a casual track day, or if you want to hire me for the day, either way, get a hold of me that way. And I'm at Tomo Racing on Instagram, and I am Tomo Space Racing on Facebook. So whether it's my personal page or one of those accounts, doesn't really matter. Um, I will answer you and try to help anywhere I can. Awesome. I think Ryan posted that. Just tag tag Tom's socials in the in the comments. All the socials. Cool. Ryan, are there any any questions that we didn't address or any comments we need to we need to bring up on the air? Anybody saying anything funny that we're missing out on? Um, there's one last thing about doing a track walk. Um, if you always do one or not. Otherwise, it seems like we've hit all the big ones. Um, there's been some side conversations that have answered most of the questions as well. Looks like the, the, the chat had some chats within it. So yes, it did. really yeah, a lot, lot of traction there. That was a question about a, a track walk if you're, a, if you're a big track walk guy. Um, I do. I really like walking tracks, especially if you get the chance to walk a racetrack in the wet. Absolutely do it. And I have a story back to most sport. My first time to most sport. Um, first time maybe second time whatever it was you know thursday night it rained and it just happened to be wet when we walked the track and we were scuffling around and we found you know it literally this far apart here was no grip and here was grip and i kind of filed that away in the back of my head and we had a rain race four days later three days later and it ended up being the only win that i had that year because i had you know back in my brain oh i know exactly where the rain line is because i walked the track and i shuffled around and I found, I didn't even do it actually, Andy Hollis, who's in the chat right, or right now, he was walking around shuffling and Andy. he taught me that trick. And uh, it was like, oh my God, I, I, if I can walk every track in the wet, you can pick up everything for the dry, still walking it in the wet. But then if you just kind of shuffle around and you find that grip, it worked really well this year at, uh, on One Lap of America as well. We got to do a couple of track walks in, in dampness um, right before we then drove in the damp. And I wore my shoes flat almost shuffling around tracks that week um, just to try to find, is there going to be grip in, in where the places I expect or is it in places I don't expect? How much does it radiate from the inside to the outside? All of that stuff. So I, yeah, you should absolutely walk. Even if you've been to the track a million times, if you can get your steps, put your Velcro shoes on. Yeah. Go, uh, yeah. go feel it out. Cool. You never know who's laid down rubber. You know, I remember being at, at Road America when IndyCar uh, ran with world challenge and we raced you know we ran on the track like before and after indycar and i remember how different the track felt just because of the different rubber compounds you know and, and so walking a track that you've walked before is always worth it because now there might be a different curb or there might be you know some new rubber in an area where there wasn't before or, you know like turn 10a at road atlanta going down the hill there's always new like skid marks and lockups and places where now in the wet you might have to go further offline to find grip because there's more rubber and all those all those little things but i, I couldn't um I have the same opinion on track walk. I've, I've just agreed with everything that you've said. So it's, there's not, not anything new there, but also right, re, re, right. what's that? That makes us both right. Right. <laughs> we have to be, we're just agreeing with each other. We're both factually correct. Yeah. <laughs> all this stuff. Um, wanted to know what you do hair care wise, just to wrap things up, you know, what are you doing to look after the main? So today I took one of the biggest risks of my entire life. I went and got a haircut like an hour ago. And I think she did okay. I don't know if you can see it, but um, I don't know. Just <laughs> somehow I've convinced everyone that my helmet hair looks the same as my normal hair, and they think it looks fine. But it's just some pomade, <laughs> hairspray in place. It's good. That's it. That's right. Bring your products with you to the track for your hair. I have this naturally like really thick hair, so all I have to do is kind of do this one, and I get that like when I have helmet <laughs> hair, I can just kind of you know. Yeah, Ryan thought, thought it was very important that I brought up hair care. He he thinks that we need to make sure that we offer hair product advice after you, after you, after you log off the it chat wanted to know it is a lot of hair care questions is that ron mullet he is the chat from what i've heard yes he is the chat he is the, the chat. chat awesome well tom thanks for taking man we've been on here almost an hour and a half i, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this and uh hopefully there's some folks that were on here tonight that work with you for some coaching who else is we got another I, I'm gonna put him on camera without any warning. I was watching this, so it's kind of weird. To, it's, it's Andy. Weird. It's Andy. <laughs> Hi. Hey, he Andy. is ASM, Andy Smenegar Motorsports. All right, now you can close out. Awesome. Yeah, check out that link that we dropped for professional coaching from ASM. Those guys know what they're doing. They also do case swaps and all sorts of um, track day and, and racing vehicle service. So hit them up for all of those odd Honda swap needs. We've got Mr. Ryan Finch here who's been 
managing the chat, like the late night show host in there, just <laughs> throwing down all the links and making sure everybody knows where to go for the information. So there you go. He's got one of the rare Gen 2s that exists in the country at the moment. These are, these are uh, hard to find. So there, there you go, a little dance. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much again, Tom. This was super fun. You got, got anything to say before we end the stream? No, just thanks for hanging out with us and I'll come back anytime. Awesome. We'll see you back at the track. Apex Pro is going to be at Midwest Festival, so we'll get to hang out there and maybe we'll do like a Facebook Live or a podcast or something cool. Awesome. All right, guys. See you later, Facebook. Thanks for joining.